John chapter 10 is where we're going to be. You know, I'm thankful that Jesus, is, uh, as a good shepherd, is, a, is meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. I, uh, you know, Paul, I would not say Paul was a continually discouraged kind of a man, I, but uh, there were times where he faced discouragement. You may recall in Acts chapter 23, particularly, we faced a measure of discouragement from, from fighting of Jews and the difficulty that he was facing. Remember, he was almost torn in pieces. And uh, that night, Jesus came to him and said, Paul, he called him by name. You know, that's what a shepherd does. He calls his own sheep by name. He said, Paul, be of good cheer. I have much people in this city. And so I, no doubt you have heard Jesus do that on your behalf, too. He's called you by name, and he's spoken a word. It was with power. It wasn't a motivational speech. It was a, when he said it, it actually happened. Be of good, good cheer, and good cheer happened. And that's part of his good shepherding, and I'm thankful that he is a good shepherd in that way. Amen. That's our subject tonight. Jesus is the good shepherd. I do want to give a short little testimony real quick of thankfulness to the Lord. I have been asking the Lord for help uh, in, my, in my preaching and teaching, and, and uh, I'm thankful for Brother Gibbons' series here in Ephesians has been absolutely wonderful, especially about faith and believing. I'm amazed at, at uh, the roots that Babylon can put into you that maybe you don't realize. As you go along, you realize that you're, they're, Babylon's more deeply rooted into your thinking than you realize, and unfortunately that has limited my ability in my studies to approach the Word of God from a purely academic viewpoint. It's, well, I shouldn't say purely. It's not that that's been the only way I've approached the Word of God. But it's greatly hampered me to depend on academic approaches to the scripture. And so God has helped me to, in my studies, to have greater ability to believe, to trust in the living God. You know, those that trust in God, they'll not be ashamed. Amen. God, God, always, God always honors men that come to him by faith, always honors faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, he always causes increased and in fruit to come from that. And so I'm thankful for that tonight, but what that means is that I'm going to, uh, at the risk of having a shorter lesson, take half of my lesson away and not do it. I, I'm afraid that I felt it might, uh, it might hinder from what I want to say most. And so at the risk of having a shorter lesson, I don't mean to shortchange you, brother, but I just want to get to what I've seen in this text the most clearly and just say that, okay? Jesus is... The good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. He says it twice in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. Now looking unto Jesus is always something that is safe. Always safe. In fact, we are encouraged to run. We have, we have mentioned this text a number of times recently. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus. See? as you're running, to continue to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Paul had this to declare to the Philippians. He said that I write the same things to you, to me indeed it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And so it is always good to look to Jesus. You'll never be reprimanded from heaven for spending too much time looking to Jesus. This is that marvelous, faithful saying of the Lord that... Uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so when you are looking to Jesus, that, that, that makes you well pleasing to the Father. And it's a very fruitful place. I have never, ever looked to Jesus with the eyes of faith that I have not been benefited by it. Amen. There's no liability in looking to Jesus, see? And so we want to keep the, keep the kind of spirit that Paul had when he said, we preach Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. And so that's what we want to do. We unfortunately have too many hirelings out there who put Jesus to the background, and the fact that the people are so miserably deficient is an evidence that they're not looking to Jesus, and they're not looking to Jesus primarily, I think, because men aren't preaching Jesus. And so I, we certainly don't want to be guilty of that, so we are going to look to this aspect of Jesus tonight, that he is the good shepherd. I am Amen. the good Amen. shepherd. John, John's expertise, John's expertise is spiritual life. 
the Apostle John. That's his expertise. In both of his letters, that's kind of how he begins. He comes out of the shoot immediately saying things like in the first chapter of John, in him was life and the life was the light of man. And of course, in 1 John, you know, life is a continuing thing there too. He talks about that eternal life and our hands have handled of the word of life. Spiritual life is something that Jesus had particularly given him to show forth to the people of God in letters. And that is a theme that runs all the way through the Gospel of John is life, okay? Life. We're not surprised that John makes note of these words in John 10 and writes them down. That's why we have chapter 10. And this extended teaching on this aspect of Jesus being the good shepherd. There are other notable chapters in John that if I say the chapter, you probably already have the predominant theme that is in there, like John chapter 4. Jesus comes to the well of Jacob. He is parched for his journeying week, and he sits there weary on the well. Of course, you know, this is a divine appointment. Mm -hmm. There's no happenstance that a woman from Samaria comes out to draw water from the well, and Jesus has a conversation with this woman talking about the water of life. One of the things he says to her is, John chapter 4, verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, you probably already knew that because there's a lengthy discourse. In fact, this takes up from verse 10 all the way down through verse 26. Jesus is elaborating on this aspect of who he is. He is the one who gives water. Not water like you get from Jacob's well, living water. And if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. How about that? See, she had to keep coming back to the well, but if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. And so that's an important theme in John chapter 4, that aspect of life. In John chapter 6, we know the theme there. The bread of life. From verse 32 all the way through 58, Jesus devotes this lengthy discourse to the fact that he is the bread of God that came down from heaven and giveth life to the world. See? One of the things he says is, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. What a word. Amen. What a word. If you eat this bread, you will live forever. This corresponds to something that Jesus says later when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the kind of bread we want, brethren. Amen. Remember he told him, he says, your fathers ate man in the wilderness and are dead. In contrast, see? In other words, there's no quadrant in the world you can go to to get this bread, even if it's, even if it's miraculous bread given by God for the sustenance of the body. But see, this bread, whoever eats of it, shall live forever, which I will give you, praise the Lord for his willingness, which I will give you, give for the life of the world. John chapter 15, what's the theme? The vine. Verse, verse 1 through 7, Jesus gives this extended teaching on the fact that he is the vine. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And so Jesus makes for productivity. Jesus is the one that makes us productive. In fact, there is no aspect of spiritual life that you can enter into apart from Christ and be proficient in it. There's no way. There isn't any way because he is the vine. And if you're a branch, your life depends on your connection to the vine. Absolutely depends on it. And so this is a continual theme throughout the Gospel of John. And I thought, you know, in all these things, there's something particular, some aspect of spiritual life that is particularly being made known there. Okay? Like in John chapter 4, the abundant nature of life is what's made known. Just think of this, brother. You drink, you take a drink from this water, and as a result of taking a drink of this water, this water becomes a well. How about that? You go from a drink to a well. 
And not just a well. See, Jacob's well wasn't springing forth. But this well does spring forth. It gushes forth unto eternal life. And so the abundant nature of life is made known there. In chapter 6, the eternality of spiritual life is made known. Whoever eats of this bread shall live forever. So the, the eternal nature of spiritual life is made known there. Okay? In chapter 15, the source of life is the point. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He's the source of life. But what's the point in John 10? There are a number of things to be seen about Jesus as a good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I am the door. If any man enter by me, he shall go in and out and find pasture. See, so he, he protects the sheep. He sustains the sheep, giving them food. But the thing that, that jumped out to me in this is that he is leading us. You see, the transient nature of spiritual life is what's being made known Amen. in this truth. The fact that spiritual life is like mobile. We're on the move. I'll tell you, Jesus was always on the move. When he was here in the world, he was always on the move. Right? That's the way it was. He'd be in the temple in the, in the daytime, and at night he was on the mountain. Always on the move, see? Going to Samaria, going to Capernaum, see? Going to, to, to minister to the gathering. Always on the move. Because that's what a good shepherd does. He's on the move. And he is a good shepherd, is leading us in and leading us out. That's what he's doing, okay? Ultimately, he's leading, out a, uh, leading us out of one place and leading us in to another, okay? And so that's the thing that stood out to me is the fact that spiritual life is transient. It's, it's like what Peter said. He said, I beseech you as pilgrims and strangers. Abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. You, you are a pilgrim. It's interesting that of all the messages that are coming out in the churches, this isn't the one that's coming across. Is that Jesus is leading us out of this world. It's what a shepherd does. He's leading us out of this world. In fact, in some places you're getting quite the opposite message, that someday Jesus is going to come and set up a kingdom in the world. <laughs> no, that's not the way it is. He's leading us out of this world. Spiritual life is a transient life. You have been made and born for another place. Amen. And so being a good shepherd means that he is the unique one qualified to both lead us out and lead us in. Brother Gibbon. This is, this is the weakness of a phrase that's been, become common among Christian leaders and teachers in the past about five years, and that's called the world view. Yeah, yeah. What is your yeah. world view? Yeah. Now they say, we, what they mean, they say, is that you look at things from God's perspective. But the, the, that term is offensive to yeah. me. I don't know yeah. what you mean. Mm -hmm. It's offensive, right. a world view. Uh -huh. We have a heaven view. See, it's, yeah. a, com yes. it's a completely yeah. different thing. That's right. The reason the if you talk about eternal life, never die, it doesn't mean anything to people, or it doesn't mean anything, you're trying to avoid it. They, will, they know they're going to die, but they don't want to think about it. Uh -huh. It's because they're so at home in this world, they'd really rather not leave. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Even though they know they have yeah. to. Uh -huh. And if it gets so painful, they want to leave, but not to go anywhere, it's just to, to get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, this is the very primary thing you're talking yeah. about here. Mm -hmm. That Jesus isn't uh -huh. leading us in our daily lives and pursuits like to make sure that we get what we want and this kind of thing. This, yeah. this is not the kind of leading he's doing. Yeah, yeah amen. amen. That's the key thing you're, yeah. you're amen. touched on here. Yeah, a person's never going to be able to overcome the world by learning all about it. Mm -hmm. Studying mm -hmm. all the intricacies of each of the cultures and <laughs> and then in that sense, they'll be able to guard themselves from, you know, all these different religions just by learning about them. We, we, we escape it by setting our affection on things above, mm -hmm. not on things of the earth. So we're actually avoiding the contact that would defile you mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Amen. And then it's like we bear our head in the sands. We're very much aware of what's going on around us, but that isn't our focus. Our emphasis isn't the world. It's the new heavens and the new world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Every human philosophy has a world view. Mm -hmm. Every philosophy does. Mm -hmm. We have another world view. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's offensive to those who yeah. love this world. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Amen. This would be a good question to ask you. What is your other world? Yeah. That's right. New world. Yeah. The next one that's coming. <laughs> the next one. The next world. Yeah. Yeah. Make a little point. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Right, sorry. It, it's the nature of sheep to need a shepherd. That's right. That's right. Needs yeah. one to lead them. And when you, yep. when the people of God, when they, when they've given their heart. When they've given their heart to the things of God, see, then everything else falls to the wayside, and then they, they do pursue uh -huh. God. When they need someone, they need a shepherd. See, Jesus is a shepherd because he's leading us to God. Mm -hmm. So we need a shepherd. That now, well, for those who are pursuing God, they need, they need someone that's a good shepherd. Mm -hmm. that's right. He's going to make sure they get along the way what they need, but he's going to make... He's going to make sure they get to God. See? Mm -hmm. That's why he's a good shepherd. Amen. Amen. Sister Jim? I'm thinking about sheep. There are wild sheep. But without a shepherd, the natural condition of sheep is prey. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. only, only with the shepherd is there safety. That's right. That's good. Yeah. Amen. 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 You know, the... I was looking over this, and well, I wanted, I'll tell you where I, I wanted to go, and, I, and I, I, I have to put an article on this or something, but he says, I know my sheep and am known of them. You know, of all the things that people always talk about, the liabilities of sheep, and, I, and that's good. Brother, tell me what you, that's right. That's what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not speaking against what you said at all, because this is the absolute truth. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, and that's the absolute truth. But here's a quality of sheep that's good, is they know his voice. They know his voice. They have that capability, huh? Brother Given. You probably heard someone say the sheep are dumb animals, and mm -hmm. that's why we're like sheep, because they're dumb animals. But this, this I think, is an inappropriate assessment. Yeah. Sheep are the way they are because they're a shadow of what we are. That's yeah. right. Amen. Amen. Not dumb, that's right. but following a leader. That's right. Amen. That's right. Leading a shepherd. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, that? it's good to discourage that. Oh, yeah. That kind of talk. Yeah. That's right. Because one asset the sheep have is they're a, they're a, they're a flock. Mm -hmm. That's they right. They flock together. Yes, yeah. That's right. That's Amen. A trade, isn't it? That's yeah. right. It is. Absolutely. If you're going to follow the shepherd, you're going to end up in a flock somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, Amen. 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 Right here among us. <laughs> Here's our flock. Or his flock, shall we say. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a number of I am's in Scripture. Okay, I'm going to make a point of this here in just a second. But there are a number of I am's, and I just want to rehearse these things for just for the benefit and encouragement of your own faith. I'm amazed at how much Jesus does. It is astounding how much, how large his ministry before the Lord is. It's astounding. For example, consider this. He says, I am the bread of life. And, of course, the one thing you want to note about this is that these are all ministries that are exclusive to Jesus. That's right. Nobody can do what Jesus does. Amen. Okay? He, he is mutually, well, not mutually, but this is exclusive to him by virtue of who he is and what he's able to do. He's the only one that can do this. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the door. And the sheep go in and out because of him. You're going in and out because he, he's the door, so he opens. He opens. See? I am the resurrection and the life, he told Martha. You remember what I said, Martha? Huh? Said I not unto you that if you believe you would see the glory of God, raise Lazarus up. I am the vine. I am the Son of God. <coughs> he was asked this question, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, when he stood before the Jewish council? And he said, I am. I like that. Well, that's a wonderful word. Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? What a word. I am. I am the light of the world. I am from above. Then yeah. he said, you're from beneath. Talking to those Jews. I am not of this world. I am meek and lowly in heart. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know 
that I am He. So He is, He is. He is the Son of Man. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. How about that for a divine quality? Remember when, when the Lord sent Moses back to Egypt? Tell him I am sent you. You call me master and lord. You say well, for so I am master and lord. He is. He is master and lord. It's all been given to his hands. Amen. Thou hast loved me from the foundation of the world. It's all been given to him. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Jesus said that after he had ascended. He said that to Paul. Okay. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. I love these declarations of the book of Revelation. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. You don't ever want to, you don't ever want to be pretentious before Jesus. You don't ever want to do that. Okay? And in your flesh, there's a tendency to kind of do that. Okay? You want to do that. He searches the reins and the heart. You know, all these are things that he is. Now, there are people that take upon occupations that they can't really do because who they are by nature doesn't fit them for the occupation. That's right. That's right. See? If, you, if, a person, uh, if a person has like an analytical mind, like Brother Gibbon has like a, a, an analytical mind, it was right for him to be a CPA, to crunch numbers and do details because that's someone who has an analytical mind. It's good for a person like that to do something like that. Or Sister Debbie... You, you are an empathetic person. You're an empathizer. That's how you are. And so you, you, you're in the right field, see, of being a nurse, caring for people. Certainly all of us have been subject to doctors who didn't have this kind of gifted quality. And they were short-sighted in their treatment because who they were by nature didn't match what they were doing. Okay, now, you don't take someone like Sister Debbie and bring her to the slaughterhouse and tell her to kill the cow. That's, that's, you don't take someone who's tender like that and then subject them to something that requires a callousness. You got to be kind of a callous person to do something like that. See, I'm not much of a hunter. I, I'll tell you that I'm no hunter. For the first animal I killed, I buried it and said a prayer for it. I cried. I, I this, but brother Levi, he can do this because by nature, who he is by nature qualifies him to do that, and who Sister Debbie is by nature qualifies her to do that, and who brother Gibbet is by nature qualifies him to do that. Now listen, brethren, when Jesus says, I am, he's speaking more to who he is than what he does. That's right. And then after that comes his ministry. That's right. Because, because who he is, brethren, qualifies him to do what he does. This is the guarantee, brethren, that there is pleasure in what Jesus does is because, see, Jesus finds pleasure in being a shepherd. A shepherd's got to have certain qualities, like being meek and lowly of heart. He's got to have that kind of quality. And being righteous and having all power. He's got to be able to be in control of everything so that if there is a wolf that has to be faced, he can bring it down. Right. has to be able to do that. He has to have that kind of discerning quality. But who Jesus is by nature qualifies him, brethren, to do what he does. Now, in specific relation to this objective of leading us out of this world and into the world to come, in John chapter 17, Jesus, knowing the time that his hour had come, that he had come into the world and was leaving the world and going back to the Father, in John chapter 17, he is very focused during this time. He's about ready to lay the foundation for men to be separated out of this world. Uh -huh. He's going to die for them. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep Amen. to this end that they might be disconnected from it by having their sins forgiven. Okay? He knows this is happening. And so in the midst of that, he prays this prayer to the Father. I have given them thy word, speaking of his disciples. I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, there right now, here's your, here's your first qualifier, brethren. Here's the first qualifier for him being a good shepherd and leading us out of the world is that he's not of the world. Uh -huh. 
You will never be able to minister to people who aren't of the world if you're of the world. We see it happen all the time. They can even sing the same words, and you kind of sense this, something's not right about here. I'm not, I'm not going to receive from somebody who's still connected to the world. I don't care who they are. And I've asked the Lord for more discernment in this area because I understand someone who's of the world can actually sing a hymn. You really don't want to benefit from people who are of the world, even if they sing the right thing. I, I just, something about that that doesn't seem right to me. Okay? Jesus is not of the world. One of the evidences of that is the fact that his teaching to his disciples had made them not of the world. The world hated them. How's the world treating you, brother? Does it hate you? If it hates you, don't lament that the world hates you. Don't, don't lament this. This is, a good, this is a good sign. He goes on to say, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says this, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So well, what does that mean? Part in this particular instance, what this means most directly is that Jesus is about to die. The world seeth me no more. <coughs> He is, he's going to be sanctified in that sense, that he's going to, he's set apart now. He's lived his entire life for this moment, is to be qualified to die, okay? Living a spotless, a, his brother, brother Jeremy says, a spotless life. He lives a spotless life for this very moment, and so that he would die for the sheep in order to liberate them from sin, from the thing that connects them to the world. But it also involves this. I sanctify myself in this sense. I'm leaving the world. That's right. Brother Given. Yes. He has, so he has to lead us from where we're going, mm -hmm. not from where we're at. See, that's what I've seen here. That's what I've seen here. You can only take people as far as you yourself have gone. Now, what does Jesus say in John 10? He says, He putteth forth his sheep and goeth before them. And they follow him. That's what he said. He goeth before them. In what sense? He has left the world. He's left it. In fact, in that text in Hebrews chapter 12, when we're encouraged, brethren, to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Paul confirms the witness by saying that he has entered in, having obtained eternal redemption, into what place? Into a place not made with hands. I go to the Father. I go to the Father. See, that's the sense in which he is sanctified. He has literally been removed utterly from the world entirely. Okay? The disciples didn't understand this. They thought it would be a better benefit to them than if he remained with them. And so it created sorrow in the heart. But he said, it's good for you that I go. Why? Because this is what qualifies him to lead the people out of the world. I am the good shepherd. See? I, I hope that came across because that was, that was kind of a, a new consideration to me. Go ahead, brother. I'm considering the, the words that John puts to this. Well, John didn't really put it, but the way Jesus says it, he says, I am the good shepherd. There's like four times in verses 7 through 14 that he says, I am the. In verse 7, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And again in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he is, he's the only, only shepherd, but in this case it's not the only shepherd that there ever was and ever will be. Because in, here in verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scattering the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not 
Yeah. For the sheep. So in in this, so he's saying, I am the superior shepherd, the only shepherd of any consequence, the only one that matters. To put it in, in simple terms, it's like supreme, superior. Mm -hmm. That's right. A hireling doesn't have any care for the flock. Yeah. He saves his own, saves his own life instead of the sheep. That's right. Yep. Which, there are shepherds, but they're under shepherds. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. 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 Amen. Uh -huh. Jesus is a shepherd and bishop of our soul. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. But there are under shepherds uh -huh. in whose care people are placed. That's right. Amen. You know, yeah. the the scripture says of Jesus that he is the forerunner who hath for us entered. Uh -huh. He's also referred to as the tried and true cornerstone. And I, I, there's a, there is a connection here between the two. Jesus, if he tells us that he's going to lead us out of this world and lead us to heaven, but he himself has not demonstrated that. See, but I'm telling you, he is tried in this regard. Yeah. He has, so to speak, run the race before us. Okay? He has done that. Which, by the way, that's a vertical race. I just saw that coming over here tonight. I was thinking, that's, that's, what, that's quite a word. You know when you said he has not demonstrated this? We... He has demonstrated the fact that he can lead us out of the world by going out himself by going out himself. He's not of this world. He has made it through yeah. the obstacles that he was required to face. Okay, He had available to him the resources that now he's providing to you and he left the world. Yeah. Left the world. He was a forerunner so he's left the world. No. No. And thus, brethren, see, this is a true and faithful witness. Yeah. If he says that I can lead them out, mm -hmm. now he has... He's gone out himself, and thus is he qualified, brother, and has demonstrated so the ability to lead people out of this world. You can't do that. You don't know the way. And all the things associated with getting to the right hand of the Father and getting out of this world, see, but he does. He's gone before you and done this and entered within the veil as the as, as Paul makes a point in the book of Hebrews. And so that's where he's leading us in that to that place. There were a lot of people that followed him yeah. who were his sheep. Yeah, that's right. But when he went to heaven, that uh -huh. that possibility is eliminated. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Amen. Yeah. It's eliminated. Yeah. Amen. And in, that, in that John 17 prayer, he says that where I am, there ye may be also. But he isn't, Jesus isn't up there wringing his hand saying, oh, I wish I could be with him down there. He's bringing us where he is yes. because he, he, he successfully escaped this realm unscathed mm -hmm. i mean if he you know he he had to die to get, to get out but yeah. but um he he still he, he rose from the dead he he was perfected forever he's now he's a faithful and merciful high priest and thanks pertaining to god <coughs> because he was tempted at all points like as we are mm -hmm. so he was equipped while he was here equipped to be able to do this work that's right mm -hmm. yeah. That's a that's a that's a telling phrase there that you may be there also. Mm -hmm. That implies that if he was if he didn't do that, you couldn't go. That's right. You couldn't be there. Yeah. Right. Amen. I mean that that sounds yep. very simplistic, oh, that's but true. That's, a, Absolutely. that's a very telling. Yeah. I, that's true. I must mm -hmm. be at that place yeah. mm -hmm. in Amen. order for you. Mm -hmm. Amen. And if I go, mm -hmm. if I go, I will yeah, come I again. Yeah. That's right. Well, you yeah. probably yeah. heard people say that. I go to the prayer of place for you. Now, he's been working on it for 2,000 years. Yeah. See, that, that's just a display of a simple mind. Yeah. Uh, him being there yes, is right. what prepares him. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, amen. Amen. Because he is the way. That's yes, right. Yeah. He himself is. That's, that's right. it. Mm -hmm. You've heard that ever. Amen. Amen. About a religious yeah. system. <laughs> yes. you are taking him 2,000 years like he's building the house, but he's not. The house has done been built. It's just yeah. being manifested. Oh, amen. That's right. Mm -hmm. he, amen. he takes us in himself. Yes. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. In That's himself he does. Because, right. see, he's the only man God will receive. Uh-huh. Right? That's right. So yeah. if you're going to be received, you have to be in him. That's yes. right. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's why the apostle speaks this way in his exposition of these things. Mm -hmm. The man, Christ Jesus. Yeah. And you had to be received by heaven. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. He was received by heaven. Yep, received up in the glory. I like that word. Received up That's in the glory. It was unreceiving. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was received up into heaven. God received him. Mm -hmm. God right. receives us because of Christ. Yeah. That's right. But to receive, for you to receive Christ, you have to come. 
That's right. Mm-hmm. Amen. Come on to me. Uh-huh. Yeah, you have to. You have to t- do whatever is necessary right. uh-huh. to get to them. Amen. Amen. If you're Amen. blind like Bartimaeus, or uh-huh. if you're a woman that's got an issue of blood, you're, yeah. you have to do what's necessary. And then in the coming, yes. you'll, Jesus will empower you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In your well, you coming. find that the fallen Amen. draws. That's right. He's drawing us. Mm-hmm. That's where we get the power. That's right. And then he draws, and, and I mean, Jesus is the one that implements the thing. Yeah, that's right. It's all through through Christ. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Now think of this. The I I am always amazed to go back and look at this great deliverance from Egypt. Of course, the purpose was for them to get into Canaan. But I was amazed as I look. I wanted to see how how did godly people look at that occasion after it happened, and how do they present it? And so I went back and looked, and it's amazing how astounding how often they refer to the leading hand of God. He was leading them, leading them. All over it's mentioned. Now, let me give you some of these. Exodus 13, 18. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. He led them out. Led them out. Psalm 78, 14. In the daytime also, he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire led them. They were people on the move. He was leading them. God's teaching us about salvation, brethren. Psalm 78, 53. He led them on safely so that they feared not. But the Red Sea overwhelmed their enemies. So so he led them on safely through dangerous territory. But he led them on. He was taking them somewhere. Psalm 106, 9. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. How about that? Say, when thou thou art in the fire, it will not compass upon thee, and then the waters will not overflow thee. Yeah, How about that? They, were, they went through the depth, so much for a skinny, deep red sea. Went through the depth. But the point is, they went through because he led them. Amen. He led them, brethren. He led them. The truth of what you said, that if you're not on the move, you can't be led. Yeah. That's right. So nobody's led by God who isn't progress and the glory. That's right. Always pass in the sea. You don't want to get far behind Psalm 107.7, he led them forth by the right way. How about that for a messianic psalm? He led them forth by the right way. That, this is to an end, that wasn't the end of the matter. That they might go to a city of habitation. That's the way he's presenting it. See, he is presenting it a specific way to teach you what salvation is about. It's about leading. It's about going somewhere. Okay? It's about leaving the place he delivered you from and getting into the place he wants to deliver you to. A habitation. That's a place where you can remain. Brother, you're not always going to be on the move. You're going to come to your habitation someday, to that safe harbor that, that the prophet talked about. See? Yeah, Brother Bob. Just to the contrast as you were talking about, it, it's evident that the Lord led them through the sea. Mm-hmm. Now remember the Egyptians, they essayed. They essayed. They, essayed. Yeah, they, they right. thought, we can do this. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference between God's people. They'll, they'll allow him to lead them. Amen. And he'll lead them in the right way. But see, they, they, they didn't think right. Yeah. And uh-huh. of course they paid the price too. That's right. They, they, they made he a bad choice. In other words, yeah. he didn't. He didn't lead them through. That's right. <laughs> Israel would have drowned in it too. That's, That's right. right. Yep. He didn't lead them yep. through. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, the Israelites decided they would go into the promised land anyway. He said, if you go, I won't go. I'm That's not going right. to be with you. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Of course, Moses said, if you don't go with us, don't send us. We don't want to go where you're not leading. <laughs> we don't want to go where you're not leading. Yeah. Now listen, the, the prophet Isaiah concurred with this, and this is the way he presented it too. I'm telling you, there's like a single witness when this event is spoken about, it's spoken about in a very particular way that has to do with the leading of God, leading out and leading in, okay? Isaiah 48, 21, they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. How about that? Not thirsting in a desert. Well, I think we know what that's like, don't we? We're in a desert of our own. From one standpoint, they wandered to the wilderness. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. But when you think you read them, they couldn't get out of it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. They couldn't get out of the wilderness because yeah. God was leading them. He was leading them in a circle, but yeah. he, he was leading them. That's right. Amen. Amen. 
He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. But the point is, he led them through the desert, which involves sustaining them. He sustained them. See, when, when Jesus is sustaining you, he's giving you some good word, he's giving you some water, some of the water of life, or things you've got to think to yourself, he's sustaining me because he's leading me out of the desert. <laughs> it's not so you can stay in the desert. It's so that he can lead you out of the desert. Amen. That's what he's doing. I, I like to think about that when he's, when he's ministering that way. There were uh, two, two adult men Mm -hmm. And then there were children that were born that were under 20. Mm -hmm. So he led the whole, the whole group was led through the wilderness, yeah. but only these other ones were led out of. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, technically, he led all the, all the unbelievers there to that's die. That's right. That's, that's why. And, and he yeah. made sure they didn't that's, get out. That's right. Yeah. And that they stayed long enough so nobody would credit this to yeah. some other cause. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'll tell you, brother, and this makes for faith, if you can see yeah. this right, that God is the only one that can lead you through the wilderness. Right. Yeah. So you can get into the wilderness. We're all in kind of like a wilderness. Everyone's in like a wilderness, but not everyone's being led out of the wilderness. Why this to Babylon the Great, that yeah. great spiritual wilderness, uh -huh. God's leading. Yes. But not everybody's being led out. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Round and round. That's right. That's right. Mm, that's sobering. Yeah, they make sure some people are confined to that that's state. Right. That's right. Because they haven't received the love of the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll be confined to that yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isaiah 63, 12 again. Of God it said that he led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. Amen. That's what it is. Right Moses, I think that's the one he had the rod in. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. That's right. That's the one they got water from. That's the one that parted the water. That's, they, yep, right. that's it. That's it. That's quite an intriguing phrase. He led them, but it was by the hand of Moses. Uh -huh. That's right. So if someone leads another person to Christ, as they would say, or leads them to receive and embellish the truth is really God who led through that. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Now think of all these, all these rehearsals that I've made. And again, let's just go back to John 10 and just let the words of Christ minister to us again. He called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. He leadeth them out. When he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him. Yeah. So you think of the wilderness when we're, when we're saying this. For they know his voice. Again, verse 16, the other sheep I have which are none of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. See, he's leading them out. I am the good shepherd. And so he's leading us. Now think about this. Spiritual life is characterized by mobility. By movement. Think about this. Spiritual life is characterized by this. For example, the whole of spiritual life is depicted as a race. Yeah. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. See? It's mobile. That's what it is. In fact, I was talking with Tasha coming over here. You know, this is a distinction. All the races that are in the world are all horizontal. But our race is vertical. We're running up. That's what we're doing. The finish line isn't in this world. If you run horizontal, you are never going to get there. we got a lot of Christians running horizontal. All they can think about is this world, but they are never going to get to heaven. I don't care how many times you circle the globe. That's not the objective of the Lord. It's not in this world. The mark of the, of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus is in the world to come. When Paul finished the race, he talked about leaving this world. That's what it was. It's a race. The term church, which is mentioned 76 times in Scripture, means the ones called out. They're called out of this world. Peter said, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
See, spiritual life's a mobile life, not leaving. We're leaving, leaving this world. Our bodies, brother, are referred to as tabernacles. You know, you couldn't have built the superstructure that Solomon built in the wilderness. It would have stayed wherever he built it. That's right. It had to be a structure that was able to be put down when you had to be on the move. Put down quickly and moved. It had to be able to move. Pick up your tabernacle and tote it. Now, they could, I keep under my body. That's right. Amen. But aren't you glad that it's a tabernacle? That's what it is. It's a tabernacle. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, and it will be dissolved, we have a building of God. Don't you love the contrast? A building of God. Aren't you glad it's not the reverse? For the ungodly, it's the reverse. They're in their building. Some senses. You know what, you know what, I, mean? You know what I mean by that? But you're in your tabernacle. It's temporary. So when, when the body doesn't cooperate, you just think to yourself, well, it's, it's not cooperating. It's a tabernacle. It's a tabernacle. That's why it didn't cooperate. And we expect for it to degenerate. Hey, here's your way out, brethren. <laughs> You'll either leave when Jesus comes again, or you're going to leave this body, which is a tabernacle. You're going to, so to speak, pack up your tabernacle, and you're out of here. See? Brethren are... Mind you, to write a book like this, it might become a bestseller. Your worst life now. Amen. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Jesus told him, he said, you have your reward. You have your reward. Yeah, Brother Ricky, I was thinking about this mobility and being on the move. The Lord showed us this, even <coughs> in Israel in the wilderness, when he went to us, because he told them, you watch the Ark of the Covenant. And when you see it move, you be ready to pack up and right. follow where it's needed. Mm -hmm. Amen. So because you mm -hmm. haven't been this way before. And I'm going to show you the way yep. that, that they had to be instant. They had to be yeah. watching yeah, whenever right. it started to move, and then they had to be ready to pack up and follow up. That's mm -hmm. right. Amen. Amen. I think a point's made of that. Because if they hadn't been this way before. Yeah, it's in Joshua 3. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that highlights. You get, see, that highlights the need for a week. That's right, amen. And it highlights the need for being light. Whatever you pack and take away, you want it to be light. I mean, if you've got some weight, brethren, if you've got some weight, if it's hard for you to run, then you've got some weight. And whatever that weight is, brethren, you've been given the ability to cast it aside. You'll sense sometimes when, sometimes Satan tries to put a weight on you. He did this to the Pharisees. Remember, they, 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 they were putting these burdens on men's backs and that's, this is the way the wicked woman is. If he can strap you with a weight, he will. We have all at some time you kind of been strapped with a weight and you had to put it aside. Okay? Well, I encourage you to do that because you're a people on the move. Amen. You don't want to be strapped down by unnecessary weights. Take what you need but don't you, don't you find in your own self that the things that God supplies are light? Kind of like the manna. They're, they're light. They don't make for a heaviness. Because you've got, to be, you've got to be on the move. There's a parallel with Israel. You know, when the cloud began to move, mm -hmm. they had to pack, get up, move. Or if you were slow, you had to make up the ground. Yeah. The right. cloud didn't wait for you. The well, cloud didn't wait for the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same when you cast off the sin and wait so easily to set you. Mm -hmm. That's not an end of itself. Amen. Now you're, going to have to, now you're going to have to make up whatever ground you lost. That's right. When you're toting that weight. Yep. Amen. Amen. Think of this, brethren, the eminence of salvation. Romans 13, 11 says that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Why is that? Because we're on the move. We're on the move. We aren't wilderness wanderers. We're in the wilderness, but we're not wandering. We're passing through. And so think to yourself, with each passing day, you're that much nearer to Canaan. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Both ends are drawing nearer. That's right. That's right. Yeah, He's cutting the work short in righteousness. He's hastening toward us. He's drawing, he's drawing near the time, and we're drawing, so see that, 
faith makes it a brief type thing. Yeah. Amen. 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 That's a that's a very comforting word. Now, let's just think for a moment, because Jesus said he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Think of some of the things that he's led us out of. The scripture declares that he's led us out of. For example, the prison house of iniquity and sin, he's led us out of that one. According to the word of the psalm in 68:18, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts of men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. He led us out. Okay? According to Isaiah, he opened prison doors. And we have that song that we sing, he opened prison doors and set the captives free. Yeah. That's what he does. He led us out. You didn't walk out of prison. Nobody walks out of prison. They have to be set free. Had to be set free. That's exactly, and I thought of that. You know, he, he didn't, he led him out. He led him out. He went into the prison, opened the door, and he led him out. That's right. Stood between him and the outside. That's right. Peter had, yeah. Peter had to follow that angel closely because the angel was the one leading him out. Now that's. Open because all the prisons would have got out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep, you got to be led out by the Lord. He's got to lead you out. Got to lead you out. Think of this He led us out of darkness and ignorance. He's done this. He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Just for, just real quickly, just for my own testimony, you know, as this was, this was like the Wednesday before last that I was starting to think about Him being a shepherd and uh, started looking at this and looking back on my own life. You know, I came out of Babylon just like you did. And I, there were some severe handicaps that I hadn't realized coming from Babylon. I, I especially took this idea that spiritual life's like a discipline thing. And so I had that journal, you know, that was real popular of, you know, adoration. So you take some time to be, ad, give adoration to God, write it in your journal. And Thanksgiving, you take some time to do that. And, and, I, and I was kind of that way. I knew very little, very little. I didn't realize how little I knew until someone began to proclaim the gospel to me. I didn't realize how little I knew. But I was subject to the devil and these things. I... And it wasn't, I, God had put it in my heart to come to Ozark. I had not known exactly why. At the time, I thought it was kind of, I'm going to be a youth minister or something. That's what I'll do. I'll be a youth minister. A lot of people come to Ozark with the intention of being youth minister. Thank God for being delivered from that. I, not that I'm against youth. I'm against the kind of youth ministers, you know, that we see today. You know what I'm talking about when I say that. So don't be offended by that. But then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go, I want to go into counseling. That's what I want to do going to counseling. So I actually left Ozark and went back to uh, the University of Oklahoma, spent a semester there because I was going to get a, a, a bachelor in psychology and do that. And then I went down to a community college, college in Oklahoma City. It was a little cheaper and, and spent some time there, semester there, doing some general studies before I got into the specifics that were associated with that bachelor's degree. Well, I was sitting down with my counselor and it came out that I had gone to Ozark and that, that I intended to be a Christian counselor. And you know what she said to me? She said, what are you doing at a secular university? I hadn't really thought about that. And I was kind of convicted by that. Yeah, what am I doing in Egypt? Get out of here. So I... Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I, I took the word. Okay, it's time to go back to Ozark. Well, when I got back to Ozark, that's when I met Sister Tasha. And uh, the Lord had plans for that. Thankfully, he delivered me from, from not so good and, and gave me such a touch. It was a marvelous thing. Anyway, I was glad for that. And, uh, but in the midst of that, I met, I met Jim Moss because I needed a job. We'd gotten married, and, and Bailey was going to be coming, and, and I, you know, I, couldn't work, I couldn't be in school full time. So I had, to, I had to get a job. Well, I just happened to, just happened to get a job at Cabinet Corner where Jim Moss worked. And this brother, he... Boy, he said that I had never even heard things that he said, but I and I and I didn't understand them. It, it was it was pretty much a one-sided conversation for for a little while, but I was I was rejoicing in what he was saying. These things were burning in my heart, and I could sense the truth of these things. These were marvelous things, and that's where I that's where I came to know Brother Given. I I met Brother Given especially at that men's retreat it was a big one. That was like a big turning point for me in understanding and things. And that's when I that's when I got to know him, and then got involved with this ministry here. But see, what is that? I am the good shepherd. He calleth his own sheep by name. 
hey, the way he calls sometimes is a very mysterious thing. He can call through all kinds of people, but he can speak to you through all kinds of people. But Jesus has a way of getting you where he wants you to get. That's right. And he didn't just do that to me. Everybody here has that kind of a testimony of being led out of Babylon and being led now to this place right here where divine light is shining. You've all got that kind of testimony, but I'm telling you that what that is is it isn't because you just had so much understanding and knew what to do. It's that Jesus is a shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And he led you out, and he led you in. He got you where he wanted you to get. That's because he's a good shepherd. That's who, that's who we're serving, brother. That's who we're serving. And that's why the increase of understanding is taking place here. It's like, it's like the psalmist when he said, he shall lead you into green pastures. Uh -huh, yeah. He can put you in a place where you can be very productive in the Lord, where there's a lot of food to sustain you, see? That's where he's led me, and that's where he's led all of us. Yeah. When you read the word good shepherd, there's a couple ways you can take it. One is that he's empathetic, and he's kind, and he's gentle, and that's true. And the other is that he, he gets done what he's going to do. That's Amen. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. that's, that's right. Good, Amen. That's Amen. He's a good shepherd. He, he gets the thing done. Yeah, that's right. He's an effective shepherd, yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. It, whatever the Lord pleases, it says, the pledge of the Lord will prosper yeah. in his hand. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you know, you know, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. But the Good Shepherd has led us safely thus far. Yeah. See, one day we're going we're gonna to make our escape because he's leading us. See, when it says he goes before them, it doesn't mean he's way out a mile ahead of them. Mm -hmm. That's not what going before them means. In fact, Jesus leads within earshot of his people. He does. His voice. They hear his voice. If he's going to lead you by his voice, he's got to be near. That's how shepherding works. And so he's with us. But he's going to lead us out and lead us in to that city, that place of habitation that he talked about. I, this Hebrews 2.10 came to mind when I thought about this. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory in bringing many sons to glory. Now here's how I reason. If he, can, if he can get you where he's got you tonight, put you in the place where he's put you, to where your life can be sustained, you've been delivered from all kinds of wolves and hirelings, you've made it safe thus far. There's a song called Safe Thus Far. Looking back over the great deliverances of God and he's put you in a process. But, but if he can do that, I assure you this good shepherd can lead you all the way home. He does not intend by any means to leave you in the wilderness any more than he intended to leave the faithful in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb, they didn't stay in the wilderness. He got them into Canaan, see? And he's going to do that. He's bringing many sons to glory. And he's going to lead us all the way into the very presence of the living God. He, I like this. Isaiah says, Thus the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. That's what he's done. He's able to present you before the presence of the glory with exceeding joy. That's our good shepherd. That's the, that's the mandate from heaven. That's the mandate from the father to his son is to bring the people home. And that's what he's going to do because he's a good shepherd. So I encourage you, give a lot of consideration, brother, and look at your... If you're not the kind of person that's been reflective about your own past, there was a time where I wasn't, wasn't very reflective and considering you want to do this. Consider how he's led you thus far. And it will encourage you to continue to trust, trust in this one that's going to lead us all the way home. So that's all I have tonight, brother. Are there any other comments that you have before we close? All right, thank you for your additions, very, very beneficial. Father, we thank you for Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the, of the sheep. We're thankful that he is a capable shepherd. We're thankful that he does this because he desires to do so and because your purpose is that he should do these things, and we're glad for that, Father. We are thankful that he's led us to places that we would never have gotten had it not been for his hand. His rod and his staff are a great comfort to our hand. 
and we put our full confidence in the fact that he'll lead us safely home. Thank you so much for Jesus, the good shepherd, that great shepherd of the sheep. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.